Father John Valadez, thanks so much for uh, coming on the pod. I really appreciate it. Good to be with you. Um, Father, I want to start um, with your journey to orthodoxy. You started off as a, as a punk rock kid growing up in Orange County, California. What, att- what attracted you to the punk rock scene? What was that like um, during the time you got into it? Um, yeah, what attracted me to it was probably um, a distaste uh, for, for a materialistic, uh, way of life. Um, anybody who has been to Orange County, especially to certain parts of Orange County will know that, um, it's very materialistic. It seems like, um, did did you grow up in a, like a upper class family? I didn't. I didn't grow really up in an upper class family, but I think just being surrounded by the extravagance and the squeaky clean materialism. Um, I don't know it. I think it provoked in me a want for something more for something deeper. Mm -hmm. And in punk rock, I found a rebellion against all of that stuff against the so-called American dream, against um, a materialistic way of life, against the cookie cutter conformity, I guess, of um, kind of Orange County culture. You know, all the houses yeah. kind of look the same. Everybody drives the <laughs> same sort of cars, you know, like, those sorts yeah. of things. Um, you should have just moved to LA. I know, right? <laughs> and so it was... Uh, so I think that uh, being surrounded by all of that um, mm-hmm. really, um, sh- really, really, um, I don't know, provoked a distaste uh, in, in my life for that kind of a thing. I just wanted something more, something different, I guess. And mm-hmm. punk rock um, at that time satisfied the itch, if you will. Uh, Mm -hmm. to dress different, to eat different, to have a different way of life um, and things like that. So this was in the late 90s. When when was this? Yeah, it would be like uh, late 90s, early 2000s, you know, so Mm -hmm. it's after many of the more famous punk rock bands and grunge bands of the 80s. And right. That's what I was thinking. Wasn't punk rock kind of dead by then? Yeah, it was sort of <laughs> it was sort of dying out, you know. Yeah. Um, but but there were but it was still a there was still a big uh subculture, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, a vein of kids that were still into this kind of stuff and bands still playing the music and things like that and so there was mm-hmm. a community of people um that met together at shows every weekend and hung out together and things like that. So even though most of the bands were long gone, um, there was still a whole culture surrounding it, you know? Do you think that was unique to you? Or do you think to you and and the other kids in the punk rock scene that they were looking for something different and and there was a rebellion uh, within punk rock that was attractive? Um, Or do you think everyone kind of desires that deep down, but what they, I feel like everyone kind of thinks they're a little punk Mm -hmm. uh, to some degree. No one, cause no one, no one's like, Hey, I'm establishment. And and you know, (laughs) everyone thinks they're a little punk, but what, what's punk to them is a little different, I think. Um, Right. But the manifestation of punkness, if you will, um, I'm going to use the word punk a hundred times. Uh, in punk music is is very in your face you know Mm -hmm. um but i look at i look at a a character like you know donald trump and the people who support him and they think they're very punk you know sure it's the punk thing to do but you know they're they're not dressing in a you know what you would say different way or whatever right so what is it really what do you what do you think it really means to be punk you know it that's a that's a really hard question to answer and i think my disillusionment with punk rock later 
um, mm -hmm. is kind of bound up in that because at the end of the day, punk rock really became for many people what it was rebelling against. So mm -hmm. for instance, you know, we would, for, let's just say style of dress, right? Mm -hmm. So we dress different in order to kind of like, you know, rebel against the conformity of the world, right? And, um, but then once you're in the punk rock scene, you're dressing this way, right? If you don't, if you're not dressed the right way, or you have a certain kind of band shirt bought at a certain kind of store <laughs> in the mall, or your hair isn't spiked the right way, or you're wearing the wrong shoes or something like this, right? This is you're, you're, you'd be labeled a poser, right? So you would, right. you wouldn't, nobody wants really, to really truly label. rock, right? So it, it became everything that it hated, mm. if you will. Um, so there was its own conformity with inside of the scene itself, you know? Um, and that's why I think death of the world's, uh, like tagline that, uh, the monks came up with in the very beginning when they put it together, the last true rebellion, it w strikes very, strikes a good, strikes a good chord because this rebellion, this punk rock rebellion, um, it ends up being the same thing at the end of the day. And so I think mm -hmm. you're very right. You know, those who, if we're taking this Trump example, for instance, those maybe who support Trump think that they're a little bit punk rock, but those also who are against him think they're a little bit punk rock, right? And so everybody's, they have mm -hmm. rebellions that are based on the passions, mm -hmm. and not on any kind of um, eternal or... Um, or some kind of a deep inner change. Yeah. You know? Let's talk about how you came to be disillusioned with punk rock and ultimately came to the conclusion you just came to now that that orthodoxy is the real, you know, last rebellion. <laughs> um, so you start off in the secular punk scene and you transition to a kind of Christian punk scene, which yeah, I wow. looked up some Christian punk music to try to listen to it. And yeah. I don't know, Father, how, why'd you like that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, my <laughs> my experience in the secular punk scene was very short, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Though I was still in contact with it throughout uh, the time until I became Orthodox, um, my involvement in it was pretty short because only a few years into listening to music and going to some shows, um, I met a guy in my high school that was part of this Protestant punk scene. And he played in a band in this Protestant punk scene. And he hung out with all the punk kids um, at lunchtime, you know, in high school. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he invited me to some of the shows and gave me some music and stuff like that. So I very quickly got sucked into the Protestant punk scene and pulled out of, um, mm -hmm. pulled out of, I guess, the danger of the, the, um, secular, uh, punk scene, which yeah. is riddled with all sorts of drugs and alcoholism and everything like that. And, um, is that, is that why you went to the Christian punk scene? No, because the don't. music, the music objectively, I think, I don't know if you can agree is worse. <laughs> it, 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 it is in some, it's in some respects, it, it definitely is. Uh, <laughs> um, and, but you know, the reason why I, 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 I think I gravitated towards it is because I was starting to go to church with some friends, right? So mm. I was torn between this secular world and then this protestant world you know and um these bands kind of kept me christian or they're not kind of they did keep me christian mm. because i probably would have fallen into this secular lifestyle uh pretty quickly you know in high school and um but these protestant bands were preaching a radical christianity you know a christianity that is against the world, a Christianity that uh, needs to be separated from the world. And, um, and it had some kind of 
asceticism to it. It had like a bite of asceticism, mm -hmm. you know, um, which I felt my Protestant church was lacking, right? Um, and so that became my real church. You know, I went to church on Sundays all the time, but um, Friday nights, Saturday, Saturday nights, Sunday nights, um, depending on the time of the year, I was at these Protestant punk shows, hanging mm -hmm. out with uh, friends who were who were into all of this stuff, and and they went to their own churches on Sundays, and so yeah, we'd have these big uh, shows with mosh pitting and all kinds of stuff, and they would break out the acoustic guitars and play Protestant. <laughs> <music. laughs> yeah. Isn't that doesn't that say something uh, that the kind of the the way you know punk rock music inherently just the tempo the screaming the stuff doesn't really align with the, the kind of christian ethos yeah that they had that they switched to acoustic after which is a little slower softer yeah it is um, interesting as, as their way of worshiping right that, mm -hmm. right right yeah it is very interesting looking back at that time for sure um it does speak volumes also to, you know, the way that Protestant worship is based on as well, because, of course, they are on a stage in front of everybody and um, kind of in this concert venue, you know, and mm -hmm. um, many evangelical, at least Protestant um, <clears throat> fashions, that, that's how they worship on Sundays is with a band yeah. in front of everybody on a stage, you know, it's very much like the concert venue. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these bands faded away for the most part and broke up or moved to different parts of the country. And when they did that, it left a big gap among all of the, all of the um, kids who were into this scene and we felt a little bit orphaned you know, not really knowing what to do or what direction to go in. And we didn't really have a place to meet. And so many of us started to go to a Bible study at a tattoo parlor um, led by Nat, who's now Orthodox priest, Father Turbo. He was the he was the tattoo artist at this tattoo parlor. And so when tattooing was done, then we would do a Bible study um, sometimes throughout the night, sometimes I remember driving home when the sun was coming up the next morning. Um, wow. And it was just called Monday nights. Everybody knew it was Monday nights. Uh, so <laughs> Monday night, we met together and did this. And but I think the, you know, the overall goal was to try to find some this radical Christianity. Um, yeah. And yeah. to try to find something more than what we were experiencing on Sundays. And Father Turbo, actually, you know, I don't know if you've heard some of his journey, but part of that journey in finding orthodoxy was that he, his wife worked for a, for a, for a Coptic man, a Coptic man, and they, he, he invited them over for dinner at a, at a, at their house. And when uh, Father Turbo walked in, he saw an icon of Christ, uh, and it really struck him as an artist and he stayed mm. up talking to this guy uh, for a long time. And I think he got some books and things like that from him um, about orthodoxy, about the early church type of a thing. And that kind of kickstarted his, his intrigue um, mm -hmm. with the early church. And um, years later, he would end up converting and telling everybody at the Bible study about it. And, um, then a few uh, a few of us would come in a little bit at a time and so the first year 30 of us were baptized together just about and the next year we had the same amount uh just to, just about come in as well and then slowly started to taper off after that but um one of those big the big um part of our transition was finding um death to the world magazines Mm -hmm. that were published in the 90s by St. Herman Velasca Monastery. And um, we come to find out that many of these bands we listened to stole their lyrics and artwork and slogans and stuff from Death to the World, just never told anybody about orthodoxy. Um, and so 
orthodoxy, that ascetic bite of of um, these punk rock bands was all um, orthodox stuff, just without mm-hmm. just being plagiarized, you know. Um, so orthodoxy was with, with us the entire time. We just really didn't know it until until later. Well, what's an example of something that uh, they plagiarized that had a that was orthodox that yeah they, just, they would just you pass know, off as so there's one band called Officer Negative, and they had a song, their most famous song. It was like the song they always ended their set with. It was a song that was like the war cry that everybody would like <laughs> pump their fist and sing along with. What the song was literally called. Uh, death to the world and that was the chorus um <laughs> and so everybody was yelling death to the world you know um and and it was all about you know dying to oneself dying to the world embracing christ forming christ in us that kind of a mm. thing um mm. and then there was another band called head noise who that one of their popular songs was called war and the very beginning to um, a book that the Death of the World authors had put together in the 90s called Youth of the Apocalypse. I think it's the prologue or the introduction. Uh, in, anyways, in the very beginning of the book, um, they took the lyrics for their song just straight from the book itself. Um, I even have it like memorized. From war to war, death and genocide, we fought for money, and power and lies. There's this whole like string of of the the entire paragraph that was Mm -hmm. for the most part plagiarized and used um in this song you know that was very popular Mm -hmm. so things were just straight taken uh straight taken and and for people who don't know or aren't familiar with the punk scene these zines their magazines and could you elaborate a little on what death to the world was and and uh yeah then how how the zines spread and and kind of the history of that definitely yeah so they zines in the punk rock scene <clears throat> were basically like little uh, magazines that could be photocopied and passed out they were usually um, typed out or written out and glued and pasted together with pictures and images and then hand photocopied and passed out at shows or passed out, you know, around town or at record stores and things like that. And um, so uh, they were, they were just easily available. You know, one could, uh, if one got a mag, a zine at a show, they could take it, they could take that zine they got and make a copy of it and then pass it out somewhere else. So they Mm -hmm. could spread this way, kind of like an underground uh, press, if you will. And And zines would be filled with all kinds of stuff. They could be political. They could be about gardening. They could be about making soap to, you know, um, some kind of social economic, you know, um, theme or whatever. There was all sorts of themes to, to these zines. And so um, Justin Marler, who was part of the, he, he was in this band called Sleep and part of um, the, kind of punk rock metal scene in the Bay Area in San Francisco. He he left the band and left the scene and became a monk at this monastery in Platina, Northern California. And when when is he, he did, still is he still a monk there? He's not a monk there anymore. Um mm-hmm. he he's now a layman and he lives in Texas. Okay. Um and we're still in contact and 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 uh talk pretty regularly here and there so he wanted to reach out to this scene that he had left behind right and also there was a little bit of a contention because many of the friends kind of wrote him off as kind of a sellout because he gave himself to religion you know Mm -hmm. and he wanted to show that this is the answer to their rebellion to their distaste for the world that orthodoxy was the answer and so he put together um, a a zine called Death to the World. And Mm -hmm. it was supposed to be a striking title in order to grab attention, um, which which it does and it continues to do. Um, Even even among Orthodox people, you know, I get get 
emails all the time like you shouldn't call this it's so violent etc etc yeah i actually wanted to bring that up i saw so <laughs> like the comments about uh, i'll ask you about that later but yeah, yeah so yeah. it's a it's a quote from saint isaac of syria mm-hmm. and saint isaac talks about how um when we when we use the world when we use the word world we mean the passions and he goes on to list the passions the passions um, are as follows, and he's a you know lust of the flesh, uh, a, a a want for um, a pride and position, envy, wanting to adorn oneself with luxur- luxurious clothes and ornaments and things like this, right? So he goes on to list all of the passions, and then he says at the end of the quote, and we print this in every magazine. He says at the end of the quote, basically, um, see which for which passions you are alive, and which passions you are dead, and then you will know how far you are alive to the world and how far you are dead to the world. So um, death to the world is literally, if we're using St. Isaac's quote, is to put the passions to death, um, to put the flesh to death um, in us. And so it was a catchy way of uh, grabbing the attention of young punk rockers who were disillusioned to or even had a hatred for some kind of Christianity Mm -hmm. and tricking them into, I guess, uh, opening the magazine and starting to read uh, what was inside of it. Because if it was some kind of blatant Christian image, if it was packaged in kind of maybe a Protestant way or Roman Catholic way, um, it probably would have been neglected and it probably wouldn't have been read um, as much as it did and Mm -hmm. as much as it was read. And so it was a covert... uh, wise way to get the magazine circulated and read yeah Um, Yeah, because if you were (laughs) holding some traditional uh, zine with like uh, traditional catholic imagery i'm sure (laughs) you wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be popular at the punk scene right (laughs) yeah why why is that why 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 is there such a distaste or animosity uh towards Christianity and maybe other forms of organized religion Mm -hmm. in the punk scene. I think that the, I think that the, the church, uh, all Christianity in general um, is looked at as uh, kind of a co-conspirator with, with, um, with the system, you know, Mm. Uh, the system that has wronged us, the system that has lied to us, the system that, continues to corrupt the world and this kind of a thing. And so there's a theme throughout um, majority of uh, punk rock band Mm -hmm. and lyrics and slogans that are anti-religion, anti the Pope, anti Christ, anti um, any of those, you know, I mean, even even in that band, you know, one of the most popular uh, popular secular punk rock bands is, the sex pistols and I am, I am the antichrist is the, you know, opening to one of their most famous songs. It's interesting because I think in culture society today, um, Christian, you know, mainstream culture, politics is Christianity is rejected. So I would think naturally you'd want to gravitate toward, but I mean, punk rock's not really a big thing anymore, but Mm -hmm. I mean, when when historically would you say this kind of sentiment in in Western society started that uh, Christianity is a co-conspirator with, uh, you know, the system, consumerism? Uh, I know Marx obviously, you know, said Christianity is, you know, the opioid of the masses and Mm -hmm. things like that. So when did that kind of mood start where Christianity started being blamed in part um, for for the woes of of you know the common man, if you will. Yeah, you know, I think I think it has always been there in the background, mm-hmm. um, and you know, I've I I remember you know growing up in the '90s, and it was kind of taboo for an adult to say they were an atheist. You know, everybody was a Christian in the '90s. Uh, if you were a, a respectable adult, you know. Um, and you may go to church just on Christmas or maybe on Easter, 
maybe not either of those, but if somebody were to ask you on the street, are you a Christian um, or do you believe in God? The answer would definitely be yes, uh, for the most part. Um, but now, you know, things are, are different. It's the opposite. And, but I don't, but I think that now maybe it is a little more truthful than it was back then. You know, um, there was this Christian facade, I think, in our culture that we supposedly were Christians and we supposedly uh, kept morals and things like this in order to be good, shiny people, you know, like good little boys and girls. Um, but um, behind it all, there was not really a heart for Christ and there was not really a heart for um the church or to be truly live a, a true life as a Christian, to have uh, daily prayers, to read scripture, that kind of a thing was, was almost non-existent uh, among mm -hmm. the masses in the nineties, though many of them would say um, back then that they were Christians or they believed in God, you know? Right. Um, now I, th now I think we're in a little bit of a better position, even though it seems like a worse position, Mm -hmm. a little bit of better position because that facade has been removed yeah you know and the reality of what people really want or um what they're really what their hearts desire is now is able in some ways to be um accepted and expressed you know um so i think that there has been a concerted effort to link um, Christian, um, ideals or morals with, uh, the kind of, with, with a, a view that, uh, Christianity is the oppressor, you know, uh, All right. doesn't allow us to live who out who we truly are, you know, but I think this has always kind of been there. If we look at movies, um, in the seventies, eighties, nineties, I think it's always been there. Mm -hmm. um, just now the real the real man behind the curtain if you will um is able to be seen if that makes sense yeah um since you mentioned movies um are you are you one of those who believe i do that movies are basically just uh psyop campaigns and uh, <laughs> you know like uh, you know christopher nolan's coming out with another movie the like oppenheimer i don't know if you've uh -huh. heard about that yeah. one it's probably gonna be the biggest movie i don't know maybe of the past decade um hmm. and they're not just inter they're not just it's not just entertainment and I think that's kind of one of the things you're kind of bringing up is seeing past the facade. Mm -hmm. um, um, do, do you have an opinion on what's going on really in, in pop culture through media, movies, music, and what a, how a Christian should approach those things, stay away from them, mm -hmm. uh, not watch them, not listen to secular music? Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit detached from like... I guess, um, popular media and movies mm -hmm. and things like that, because I do think that, um, it is very harmful, um, to a person. It can be very harmful to the soul. Um, and, and for other reasons too, you know, there's, there's a great letter by Alexander Solzhenitsyn before he, it was his last letter, um, before he was exiled from Russia. And he kind of gives like rules, uh, how, how a person is to live with dignity in a communist society. He said, and he says, if we're not brave enough to go out in the street and protest, you know, and be captured and thrown in prison, then at least we can follow these rules. And he gives a list. I don't know if it's 10 rules or something like that, but in his, in his list, one of those rules is to, um, that if you're in a lecture, attending a lecture or watching something that has lies in it, to not participate in it and to get up and walk out. That was one of his, um, one of his rules that he gave. 
And it would be walking out of everything. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> how so could I, you, how could, how could any college student graduate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I think, so one. I think what the, the big takeaway from that is that we have to really be um, careful with not only what we're participating in, but also what we're um, letting in and what we're watching. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we, if we don't agree, for instance, with um, the way that the LGBTQ movement, for instance, is going, um, and but yet we still watch shows or um, help fund movies, right, by going to the movie theater and watching these movies that have this stuff in it, um, we mm -hmm. shouldn't be so, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that like it doesn't affect us, you know, when we're letting mm -hmm. images come into, to our eyes, it's not passive, you know, watching mm -hmm. a movie is not passive. Um, it is still making some kind of impression on the soul. And so we have to be careful with what we're letting in, uh, what we're participating in and um, what we're allowing to continue to kind of, um, you know, uh, progress in our culture, mm -hmm. if you will, even though it's yeah. not really progression. Um, so one, one way to combat that is to not participate in it, but do you think Christians should actively oppose it and by maybe creating an alternative i know I, I don't know if you've heard of angel studios they're the kind of people behind the chosen series and mm -hmm. and this new movie sound of freedom if you've heard about it mm -hmm. um have you do, do you have any thoughts on that and um, is that a is that a good approach or should uh, is even participating in it uh you know one movie i think we've both we've both seen because i know you're uh love saint nectarios as man of god too yeah so i thought i thought that was great i'd love to see way more movies like that the definitely was made the, the movie was well made definitely <laughs> yeah no i think it's good to participate in in movements against what is going on and to cultivate mm -hmm. alternatives for it for sure um and i think that there are more people out there that want these alternatives than, mm -hmm. than what the zeitgeist is letting on to you know yeah um i think when people are making these um these alternatives for the most part they're pretty successful um yeah they and, have been and uh, people, uh so it shows that there's a thirst you know for something outside of um this uh kind of propaganda machine <laughs> yeah yeah um I want to go back. I want to go back to the uh, the Bible study with Father Turbo at this tattoo parlor. We kind of glossed over that a little too quickly. Um, how did that? How did that start? Were you guys like his customers, and he was talking about Christ, and he said, "Hey, let's start a Bible study." What's What's the origin story there? Yeah, you know, I don't know because I came into it later, so it's oh, a good question it. to ask him. Like, okay. what the origin story from the Bible study is. Um, you know, I would guess that it kind of started off in um, a more casual way like that, but I'm not sure exactly. I know mm -hmm. when we first, when I first started going, there was a women's Bible study that his wife did, and then a men's Bible study that was at a tattoo parlor. And so they were both, they were separated. Um, and mm -hmm. then at a certain point, uh, we converged them both together at the tattoo parlor. Um, and it became a lot bigger after that. Um, but that's, that's really the only like background I have to it. You know, the structure mm -hmm. of it was that we, that we showed up and we, I don't remember if we did like, or like, I don't know if we did like Protestant praise songs or anything on a guitar. I don't remember that. Uh, I could be totally wrong and be corrected on that for sure. But I don't remember like busting out an acoustic guitar and doing little praise songs or anything like that, but we might have. But the real meat of it all was um, was studying a certain certain part of scripture and really having an in depth conversation um, about it, you know, mm -hmm. and questions and 
um, you know, a lot of people are going through a lot of different stuff and addressing those things that were addressed in a way that our churches on Sunday were not addressing um, the issue. Yeah. And, um, do you so. think? Uh, do you think the fact that it was it sounds like it was a men's uh, Bible study help facilitate more open dialogue and discussion? Maybe, maybe. I think it's just also the the people, you know, um, mm-hmm. especially Father Turbo's person that led it because he really has a bleeding heart for people, you know, and a real love for people. He's a great pastor and um, a really salt of the earth type of guy, you know, in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. And so I think that's what mostly uh, really facilitated it. You know, do you do you do a regular Bible study at your parish now? We do a regular study. We don't always go through a part or section of scripture, but every Wednesday we have like a a parish um, education type of a night. Um, Mm -hmm. And I give lectures depend uh, on different subjects. So right now we're going through the divine liturgy, but. Um, a couple of lectures ago, we went through the book of the beginning of the book of Genesis and things like that. And so there are, um, you know, different topics that we go through, but not always like a book of scripture. Yeah. So death to the world, um, the tagline of, uh, you know, the last true rebellion. And, and you mentioned that St. Isaac quote, mm-hmm. right. Um, you may, I've heard you say that, uh, Passions are inversions of God's gifts. Uh, what does that mean? Um, St. Uh, Maximus Confessor is really great at explaining this. And he talks about basically how the the passions are just mutations or inversions of the virtues. You know, um, so for every virtue there's uh, a twisted version of it that is a passion, you know. Um, chastity is twisted and inverted into um, lust, for instance, or mm-hmm. uh, fasting into gluttony, um, all of these things, right? Um, mm-hmm. Temperance and um, and being content, it can be um, twisted into a lust for more, want for more, right? And, and envy for others if what they have, what, if they have what we want and those kinds of things. And so um, he would, he would say that all of the virtues are, are, are attributes or characteristics of God, right? And um, characteristics that we were created with in his image. Um, but because of our fall, we have mutated or perverted the, pa- the, the virtues into passions, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, getting rid of the passions is not just cutting them out of our life. It's not just to stop lying. It's not to just stop looking at porn on the internet. It's not to just stop um, eating too much or stop being angry or whatever. It's actually the cultivation of the virtue which is the opposite of our passion you know um to cultivate chastity uh both uh with our eyes and what we look at and also with our heart right and to cultivate honesty not just with not lying but also with uh speaking telling the truth and uh looking at things with a clear perspective in our own mind right so um we have just perverted what god has created us with and Mm -hmm. so the spiritual life is all about um correcting that perversion and um why doesn't it why doesn't it feel good just like the passions you know the passions feel good right away (laughs) but what you're saying i'm sure you're gonna tell me it's gonna feel good later (laughs) just keep just keep doing it but (laughs) but fasting temperance yeah you know patience they they don't they don't seem you know content contentness that doesn't seem very uh 
Yeah. It doesn't seem like a gift, you know, <laughs> those are God's <laughs> gifts, you know, <laughs> you know, I kind of, sure. I'll take a different gift, please. Sure. Um, you know, it is have to say that the passions always give a immediate pleasure or satisfaction. Um, mm -hmm. But in the end, they always end up in pain. Right. And the opposite is true many times for the virtues is that they all they always when we're cultivating them require some kind of pain but in the end they give true pleasure lasting pleasure the kingdom of god uh ple the pleasure of of grace of the holy spirit and um so it's kind of like um if you take this analogy it's kind of like working out for instance you know mm -hmm. um when a person works out, they, they have to endure a certain amount of pain, right? In order to uh, attain a, a certain physique or um, a, healthy, a healthy disposition in their life physically, right? They have to endure some kind of pain, whether that's running or lifting weights or whatever it may be. The soreness, right? The, the feeling of being out of breath, all that kind of stuff takes pain and it exerts a certain amount of energy um, but in the end the the um, reward for that is a healthy body a you know uh, a, an, a, a stronger immune system and all these other kinds of things that go with it you know um, but um, you know if but wanting you know eating nachos and burritos and tacos all day, sounds much better than getting up at six o'clock in the morning and taking a run around the block, you know? Um, yeah. And, uh, but in the end, you know, um, if we, if we continue, if we're gluttons, right. And we're lazy and we lay around at the end of our life, we'll also suffer a certain kind of pain, right. Mm -hmm. Whether that be, um, physical problems or mental problems or problems with our body, whatever it may be, right? And so the real question is, do we want pleasure now and then pain later? Or are we willing to endure a little bit of pain now for pleasure that's everlasting, mm -hmm. right? Well, what if I agree with you, Father? Hey, I agree with you, Father, but I just want a little bit of pleasure. You know, I'm not going to eat nachos every day. All right, I'll go for that 6 a.m. run, but I want to just keep a couple, a couple passions, a one couple passion, passions, a little small passion, you know? Um, yeah. Is that going to prevent me from receiving God's gifts? Or, I mean, it's, you know. We all have our little passions that we want to keep a little bit of, sure, right? Sure. You know, I want sure. to watch that that really bad show because I just it's just so fun for me, <laughs> you know. Um, but I'll read the scriptures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, this is our constant struggle and battle, um, but God re requires our entire heart, the entirety of our heart. He doesn't want just a little bit or just one room in our heart or one corner to be in, but he mm -hmm. wants the entirety of our heart. And I think sometimes it's when we look at ourselves, we really truly look and stand and um, stand at the abyss, I guess, and, and stare into who we truly are. All of our passions can be very overwhelming and um, we want to keep some of them for comfort. You know, we're scared that God might take this or that away from us. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, a, a good rule of thumb is really to look at the passion that really plagues us the most. Um, whether that be anger or greed or lust or whatever it may be, the passion that plagues us the most, the thing that we're always running to confession for, the thing that we're always... Um, we have our head hanging low, you know, in liturgy or in services because of that's the first passion that we go after, right? And then the rest of the passions we tackle later, one at a time. But mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good way to 
Uh, and the fathers talk about this too as kind of a battle tactic in the unseen warfare is to take one passion on at a time, first and foremost, the biggest one. And as um, St. Nicodemus says, we can't fight them all at the same time. Can't fight them all at the same time. So mm -hmm. how do we have the uh, clarity that to be able to do that introspection and know what our biggest passion is i think it's i think it should be pretty obvious for anybody mm -hmm. living even a small uh a little bit of a of a spiritual life you know mm -hmm. um because it will be the thing that the conscience is always bothering us about or mm -hmm. um the thing that is always on our heart like i said in confession something like that you know um, we have to take also a little bit of time each day and really examine what we've done throughout the day. Um, I know there are some wonderful, uh, prayer books that have at the very end of evening prayers, will have, um, a little a blurb that will basically say, you know, as you lay down to sleep, um, think about all your actions and movements throughout the day and, um, and ask for asking God if we've done anything that is contrary to the will of God or that strikes our conscience to ask God to help us to correct it the next day, you know? And so there's a, there's a good, you know, this is a good rule to have, to, to have some kind of introspection, to have some kind of um, self-reflection every day of our life. And if we can't do it every day, at least we should do it before we're going and partaking in Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. um, be a little bit self-aware of ourselves, you know, um, I think the, um, you know, it's one of the problems in modern culture with all of the, the technologies we have and devices we have is that, uh, we're distracted, not only just from life in general, we're really distracted from our own heart, the movements of our own heart and what we're doing, what we're letting into our life and all these kinds of things. And so, um, mm -hmm. there, it's a must to stop once in a while and really yeah. look inward. I'm going to make a sharp right turn just because you brought up technology. Yeah. Um, it seems technology and the human are growing closer and closer yeah. together. And there's transhumanism <laughs> is yeah. becoming way more mainstream than ever. Um, what do you think about a guy like Elon Musk? Like on the one hand, oh, he's pretty cool. He's like kind of punk. But on the other <laughs> hand, is this guy like ushering, you know, the, the Antichrist in? <laughs> yeah, yeah like, I'm kind of. I don't know. I don't know where to land on this guy. Yeah, it's uh, you know, and I think that his uh, maybe personality is this type of personality of like we don't know where to land. You know, with mm -hmm. him, it's probably the most dangerous kind of personality. Because when somebody's evil and outright talking about evil plans, and that's all they talk about, then it's very easy to be like, okay, mm -hmm. we should stay away from this guy. But when somebody's talking about something evil one day and then the next day, they're like the free savior speech. of this or, yeah. or free speech or whatever, you know, yeah. and, and it's harder to be like, okay, this guy is like bad. Like, let's stay away from this guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this whole, his his whole um movement with Neuralink and trying to basically merge uh humanity with ai and uh so that we can he said he, he basically says the at least last time i saw a few interview interviews on this um Neuralink stuff is that we basically have to get these implants um into our brain uh these chips put in our brain in order to help us think faster, right? A computer can think faster. A computer can do things faster. So AI will be able to basically uh, out evolve us at some point, mm -hmm. right? We're going to be left behind. And so we have to take this step in order to uh, save humanity, you know, um, from being overtaken by technology. And, um, you know, he, at least last I last I know, you know, he doesn't believe in God, and um, there is no there is no worldview 
um, a Christian worldview that kind of holds back uh, mm -hmm. from um, any kind of uh, moral red flags or whatever that would go up um, in in promoting this kind of uh, technology to be implanted into a human being, right? Um, and so it's very scary, you know? Yeah. Um, Think, things are moving so fast in that direction. I, I don't yeah. even think people realize like chat GPT and, and AI, like, <laughs> like, like three months ago, nobody knew anything about that. Now <laughs> everyone, now like, you know, your, your grandma might be using chat GPT. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. wild. It, it's crazy. It's moving Absolutely. so fast. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. It's on the one hand, I want to embrace that stuff because it makes life so much easier. <laughs> sure, um, sure. But on the but on the other hand, um, I'm 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 worried about where is this leading? Is that is that worry? Is that worry about the end times and, and moving closer to the apocalypse and, and globalism and the antichrist? Is that a is being worried about it wrong for Christians? Should we just hey, this is coming, accept it and you know, are, like, are we, are, sh should we be trying to slow it down? Like, what, what should we be doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, hold up, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> there is definitely a healthy fear that should be had, right? Mm -hmm. um, you talk about being a balanced Christian. We oh, have to be balanced. Yeah. We can't be like obsessed with the end of the world all of the time and talking about it and being a weirdo, you know? Um, but we have to at the same time be aware of what's really going on around us and we can't just we can't just be you know throwing up like oh this is a conspiracy flags everywhere right we have to be balanced we have to know what's going on really around us and uh but not be a weirdo about it and um can't be sitting there obsessed with dates and prophecies and this and that right life has to be balanced and the christian worldview has to be balanced we have to, I think, be aware of what certain saints have said about the end times and what will happen and things like that, of course. Um, well, that's just prudent, you know, um, but to base one's whole life around it and be obsessed with it is a totally different um, spirit, you know, that these elders and saints did not have um, mm -hmm. when talking about this kinds of these these kinds of things. And so... Yeah, in some respects, we should try to slow it down. But in other respects, um, it, it is the inevitable, you know. Um, but the thing that holds it back, that restrains, is the divine services. This is what restrains the spirit of the Antichrist, right? Mm. Because even the, the Holy Apostles talked about how the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world, right? And um, what has restrained the devils it ha is always the divine liturgy, is always the divine liturgy. And I think that the big thing that we missed during COVID and all, all the lockdown things and the scares during all of it, um, whatever side one lands on or not in that whole debacle that happened i think that all christians all or especially orthodox christians need to um see our fault in that um there were certain hierarchs and um priests uh, clergy that ceased doing liturgies you know um or didn't allow the people to come to liturgies yeah and we did that during 2020 and since that time until now, we have seen um, moral uh, Im immorality and depravity um, accelerate at like light speed. Yeah. You know? Um, and so we have to be, I think, honest with ourselves and um, hold ourselves accountable for, for allowing that to happen. You know what was remarkable to me during that time, Father, was... It was it was the Protestants who were rebelling against the government yeah. and saying yeah. we're not going to close down our churches. You're crazy. Yeah. Maybe they had some. You know. Uh, you know. I'm not. I'm not going to be cynical. I, I just think they they did it out of love for God. Mm -hmm. um, but but it was the Orthodox who just went along with it. Hum ho. Yeah. Um, 
And and so that's that's where I kind of struggle with orthodoxy being punk but very conformist. Like yes. <laughs> we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna cause any ruckus, you know. But we're yeah. but we're different. But yeah, yeah. You know, but I so, think so, yeah. I think you know, like, but if we really look at, you know, because there is there is true orthodoxy that you know Saint Nectarios would say it cannot be blemished by any man. Right, he says it's in- infallible. That mm-hmm. orthodoxy is infallible, um, in that it is Christ Himself. Right, and so when a person steps out of of the kind of tradition or the mindset of the church, which is the mindset of Christ, and begins to teach his own opinions or do his own things, mm-hmm. right, he he is not acting as the church. He's not acting um orthodox and father seraphim said this too you know that we have to we have to be orthodox in every aspect of our life or or else we're not orthodox at all even if we you know say that we are and we have this kind of formal name of being orthodox and so i think that there's also you know that balance too and what happened um years ago is that you know we had certain figures of the church want to shut down um, liturgies and services to the faithful and close off and bar communion in certain ways and things like that. But I think if we looked at the spirit of the saints, I don't think we could ever see like St. Anthony the Great or St. Macarius the Great or Abba Poeman or any any of those fathers um, Mm -hmm. bowing down to something like that, right? Um, and closing their monasteries and not giving people communion and things like that, right? We see mm-hmm. we see the total opposite in these fathers that uh, of the desert, you know, that they they put they put themselves in the face of danger, right? Um, mm-hmm. Saint Anthony the Great, when there was the persecutions happening in um, Alexandria, right? He went with his monks into Alexandria to be martyred right? Mm -hmm. He didn't run away from the threat. He, he ran to the threat. And, Mm -hmm. um, and we saw that in early, um, Christian documents as well. Um, when plagues would hit in Egypt, for instance, um, I forget what plague, the name of the plague, but, um, during Roman times, you know, Christians would be seen running into the cities to care for, the infected that were thrown out of their homes onto the streets and all of the doctors and physicians and wealthy people would be fleeing um, from the cities, you know, into more mm-hmm. safe uh, places that they had. And so it has always been the Christians who have um, ran uh, and stood in the face of death. Right. And mm-hmm. uh, said, we'll follow Christ no matter what will happen, uh, what will happen to us. And that kind of boldness in the early church is really what won uh, pagans over to Christ. You know, who are these people that they don't even fear death and they don't Mm -hmm. even fear sickness, you know, who are these people and what, what's, what's going on with them, right? What are they, what are they, what are their lives all about? Right. And Mm-hmm. I think we unfortunately missed a great opportunity to be witnesses during during that time, um, during that COVID time. Why why do you think we fear death so much now, as opposed to the martyrs and saints uh, of our past who embraced death? Um, I think there's there's a lot of reasons, but mm-hmm. um, I think a main one is, you know. Um, St. John of the Ladder and one of his steps, he talks about uh, fear, the passion of fear. Mm -hmm. And Isaac of Syria lists lists this in the depth of the world uh, quote as well, um, an irrational fear or fear as a passion. Um, And and if we were talking about, you know, the mutation of a virtue into a passion, you know, the, the trust in God's will is a virtue. Right. And fear for our own selves, what may happen um, is is a passion. And um, he talks, you know, it was so it was so perfect for the COVID time because 
he talked about how uh, vainglory, fear is a daughter of vainglory, right? And our entire society, and we've been saying this for many, many years, you know, the me generation, obsessed with oneself, right? Self-centered, um, that the world has become this way, um, entirely bound up with oneself and the worship of the self and um, the want for self-preservation and even all of this, uh, you know, technology stuff and the transhumanism stuff is all bound up in this as well to preserve ourselves from death to mm -hmm. preserve ourselves from this to make ourselves better right and there's this where there's this uh emphasis on on the self um on the self and um he says that if we're if we're full of vainglory if we're full with the love of self that fear is inevitably going to be one of our passions because we will be scared that whatever we're trying to preserve will be taken away you know and he talks about this in the lives of the desert fathers where he says that some um acquire a an irrational fear of something that has never even happened or has not happened yet to oneself and that really plagued us during that time because we we're like oh what if what if this and this, and this <laughs> what if we yeah. everybody gets sick and we all die? Like it, it, it didn't happen, never happened. Right. It, didn't, yeah, yeah. it hasn't happened to us, but we're, but we're fearing that it's going mm -hmm. to happen. Right. Um, his remedy for it. And the latter was uh, to go out and to go to the place that you're scared of. Cause he said, mm -hmm. one of the things that plagued the desert fathers was that, they would develop an irrational fear of wild animals or wild beasts, right? So you're out in the middle of the desert. You have this overwhelming fear that maybe there's a lion lurking behind you and you're going to be eaten or yeah. overtaken by a pack of wolves or something like this, right? And so he he would say, go out to the place that you you feel that fear and stand there and pray there until that fear is overcome, you know? Yeah. So his his remedy was go into the face of the fear. Um, so answer to answer your question, I really think that uh, the reason why we are so captivated um, by this fear during COVID was that we we really are obsessed with ourselves, and we were scared that there's there are certain things that we want to preserve about our way of life that. Yeah. We, taken away from us and we are so scared that we would that we gave up so many things about our life in order to mm -hmm. preserve um um what we want uh about ourselves you know um with this false hope that it will all just come back to normal one day type of a thing which it still um i don't think has come back to normal and i don't know if it ever will um come back to quote unquote normal but um and and what's interesting about it is that uh, I agree with you. I think it was uh, had a lot to do with obsession and with ourselves, but but it was always but it was always you know couched in no. This is about grandma. This is about our neighbors. Yes. This is yes. about someone else. Yes. Um, when when really deep down, <laughs> it, was, it was just about <laughs> us. <laughs> um, yeah. And so this is part of the fakeness of Christianity, right? That gets people jaded, right? Yes. Um, for people who are jaded, and I see this all the time, every every week or so, I'll scroll Facebook or I'll do something and I'll see someone talking about, I went to this church for so many years and I never felt <clears throat> the love of Christ. It was just all hypocrites and, mm -hmm. yeah, and yada, yada. How do we, how do we respond uh, to that sentiment, to that person? I think we got a, uh, I think there's some work to do in that um, we have to separate the pain that people have caused us mm -hmm. um, and not allow it. I mean, it can be very real, um, especially in really hard circumstances. Um, but we can't allow it to blind the, those uh, circumstances to blind ourselves to who Christ, who Christ truly is. Right. Because 
there are hypocrites everywhere. There's hypocrites in the secular world. There's hypocrites in the political world, um, obviously. And they're, they're, <laughs> they're hypocrites, um, unfortunately, in our churches, you know. And um, so wherever we go, we will encounter some sort of human weakness. Mm -hmm. But the trick is to not allow this human weakness to... Um, you know, um, distort our vision of who Christ truly is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to address that criticism of death to the world that maybe we hear recurring yeah. and that it's, uh, and I, you know what I want to do is I'm going to share for anyone who haven't, hasn't seen the website and the imagery, I'm going to just share the, the website, um, One moment. Uh, I got to pull it up. But basically, if you can describe like um, what it, you know, what it looks is it's it's directed towards uh, punk rock, punk yeah. rock scene. So yeah. obviously, it's a little darker. It's black and white. Yeah. The fonts funny. There's you know skulls. Um, <laughs> uh, can you describe it? And and you're an artist yourself, so. Um, yeah, it. I mean, it 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 takes on a lot of the kind of dark gothic or punk rock imagery, and marries it with stuff in the church, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm sharing right, it right now. Instance, I don't the, know if you can the, see it. Yeah, they're at the top of the the screen. You know, um, those are skulls in the monastery, right? That are put on the wall, and. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, these skulls and things like that are very fashionable and um, attractive to this punk yeah. rock kind of metal gothic aesthetic, you know. Yeah, and here are the the covers of some of the zines um, uh, from your merch uh, section yeah. on the website. And um, here here are some of the shirts. The so someone color. someone may look at that and say, "Hey." Uh, you know, Christianity is supposed to be, you know, preaching the good news, the, that life, not death, you know, Christ conquered yeah. death by his death. Yeah. Um, so obviously, Eknekron, for anyone who doesn't know, it's coming from Christos Anisti Eknekron. From right? the dead. Yeah. yeah. Christ is risen from the dead. Um, but they want you to focus on the other part, the Christ is risen. Um, uh, what do you, what do you have to, to say, say to those folks and, yeah, you know, I, I, like I said, I encounter this quite a bit, you know, through emails mm -hmm. or um, various interactions that we, uh, that uh, the name is too dark or the imagery is too dark and things like that. And I certainly, um, you know, can understand some of the sentiment with it. Um, but it really, um, you know, it, in order to preach the gospel to someone that is, um, totally disillusioned by any classical Christian imagery or classical Christian slogans or Bible verses or whatever it may be um, in order to kind of sneak in the back door, this gospel of the good news um, death world was packaged and continues to be sort of packaged in a different way, as we talked about before. So that orthodoxy would be given a chance that mm -hmm. uh, be able to open up and to, uh, and to speak, you know, um, but I think even further than that, you know, many, uh, and from my own experience, um, many people that are stuck in these subcultures, uh, of the metal scene of punk rock of the Gothic scene and things like that, many people are stuck in these subcultures. Um, they relate to this dark imagery because it is something that they are feeling on the inside. Um, mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in the Gothic, uh, punk metal secular scenes, all of this imagery is, at the end of it is, it, it's nihilistic, right? And it is, um, it just leads into a further darkness, 
you know, it attracts towards darkness and it leads into darkness. And as many of the very famous punk bands in the early, you know, beginning of the movement in the late seventies, and they would say there is no future, right? We're just living. We're just mm-hmm. living day to day. There is no future. There's no end to our rebellion. There's no end to this darkness. And um, death is a reality. You know, you're born to die, live fast, die young, you know? Um, and so the imagery of all this stuff is attractive and, but with, with, um, death to the world, you know, it's not just some random skull or, uh, whatever sucking one <laughs> of a darker thing. It's usually, um, it's usually relics and, um, saints and desert fathers and the lives of them and the casting out of demons and the real spiritual warfare that happened with like saint anthony or some of these modern fathers um or whatever the encounter with darkness right and and the triumph over it is Mm -hmm. um, is what really a death world is preaching and so while one might be really attracted to the skulls on the front page of our website or um or some image of a, you know, long bearded monk in a black robe, you know, holding a skull on the, on the cover of an issue or something like that. Um, it has a different story behind it than it just being dead, um, nothingness, no future, mm-hmm. right? It has these, has all the overtones of resurrection, of conquering death, of becoming a saint, of um, living, uh, contrary to our passions and contrary to the world and that being a means for a future, um, um, in paradise and, um, a future that is not bound up by the materialism and all the disgusting stuff, uh, one might be rebelling against in this world. Mm -hmm. What is, what is it about Christianity where you can practice, uh, you know, memento mori remembering death? But that doesn't lead you to despair, but hope and, and yeah. life and and the light. So this is this is kind of the beginning, right? Of 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 someone's conversion if they're coming from the punk scene and it was yours. You didn't yeah. stop at the skulls and <laughs> and the black and white. Um, what is it that turns that into joy and and, and mm-hmm. out of um, out of that instead of despair? Yeah, because it gives an answer, I think, to the pain and the despair that is being felt. Mm-hmm. You know, where in the secular world, there is no answer for it. It's just that's how it is and how we cope with it is through our own passions. And, um, and you know, that's, that's how mm-hmm. it is, why suicide is so rampant and drug addiction is so prevalent and alcoholism is so big in these um, subcultures it's because there's no mm-hmm. answer for the pain. You know, there's no answer to um, the disillusionment um, in this world and in society. So, yeah. Well, I think a big part of it is <laughs> is looking for the true answer, right? Because you did that really great series on your Ecnacron podcast, um, the survival series for Orthodox Christians. Uh, mm. I might I might be having the title wrong, but that series I thought really explored um, a lot of the the fake answers. You, you know, you talked about uh, Eastern kind of spirituality and and, and yoga and, and gurus and all of that stuff. Um, but though, but those never really satisfy. There, right? There's a uh, yeah. Um, all right, Abba, I want to I want to address this uh, while I have you. I'm Coptic Orthodox. Uh, you're you're part of the EO Antiochian specifically. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you you agreed to come on this podcast. Uh, no hesitation. Out of you know, just I really appreciate that you didn't know me. Um, what do you think? Is anything happening towards towards unity? between all of the different orthodox families and there's different kind of people on the spectrum some that won't even recognize the coptic people as orthodox uh, mm-hmm. and vice versa and 
So, you know, where do you land on that? And, and uh, maybe we can, you know, start some grassroots right now towards, towards <laughs> unity. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think that there's, there's... because father listen because i i didn't i, I should just uh, i should uh, highlight this a lot right now you said that father turbo's uh wife went to a coptic guy's house and, yes. and there's an icon there so um i thought i thought that was beautiful that that was part of the origin story although he didn't become coptic orthodox mm -hmm. himself um yeah uh, you know it's nice um but Go ahead. I just wanted to bring that up one more time. <laughs> no, yeah, and it's definitely it's definitely a wonderful thing because it is part of everything. Is that first icon of that Coptic man's house and his own piety, right? That really brought um, um, about this beginning of the the grassroots uh, movement, if you will, of of uh, looking into the early church and things like that, and. Um, you know, it's a hard question because, like you said, there's there's people that are all over this kind of you know spectrum on 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 the issue and the division between um, between you know the Eastern Orthodox and and the Coptic Church and and the rest of the Oriental um, churches. And I think that on one hand for us to be super soft about it um mm -hmm. and just pretend that there's no there was no um you know real uh theological division and things like that i think that's a little bit naive you know and probably reading into history mm -hmm. um, um with our own kind of prejudices i think um, so I don't think that it does any justice for us to just pretend like there's nothing, there's no division and that no theological squabble ever took place. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at the same time, I think that it's also, it can also be really detrimental as well to completely, um, be super hard line and not really recognize the, um the spiritual leg legacy of the coptic church as well you know um mm -hmm. and and just to give an example for instance you know at um i went i went when i went to seminary and i won't say which one but i'm sure people can just find out but <laughs> when i went to seminary for instance you know we had a lecture every the beginning of great lent the beginning of great lent um the first week of Great Lent, we always had a lecturer that would come and give us a talk, you know, on 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 the church or on a spiritual life or whatever it was. And um, my three years of being there, the only really um, spiritually edifying talk that I remember being given that actually used um, the Desert Fathers and the depth of their prayer life and uh, what that meant during Great Lent and things like that was from a Coptic bishop that came. You know, the other two years we had um, Eastern Orthodox people that mm -hmm. were there um, that taught us, but none of that stu stuck and it wasn't um, talked about, uh, you know, the spiritual life wasn't talked about with such... Um, piety or understanding probably um, as this Coptic bishop had given to us. So I think that there's there's something to recognize this inheritance of the Desert Fathers that's very, very um, prevalent within the Coptic Church and the love for the Desert Fathers and desert monasticism. Um, this is inheritance that has been given, that has continued, I think, um, to be loved and adored and cherished. Mm -hmm. um, by the Coptic people um, is something that really needs to be admired um, and looked looked at with with um, with eyes of ed edification, you know, um, mm -hmm. because um, the the Coptic people will put many of our you know our in, our quote unquote intellectual Orthodox theologians to shame. Um, because of the love for asceticism and the mystical life and um, the devotion and piety and services and things like that, right? So there's some love to be had uh, with that and, and some ears that should be open 
um, mm -hmm. more edification um, in that regard. So, but at the same time, I think we have to also come into a really deep dialogue um, and a real dialogue of what what exactly are our differences and how do we overcome those things theologically? You know, um, I kind of who, ne who needs to be having that dialogue? Like, I think our our hierarchs need to be having that dialogue. I, I why aren't they? I mean, why do you think they aren't? You don't know, obviously, <laughs> but is it just is it just not an important thing? Like that is because I I wonder question. like is is just everyone just content yeah. with hey we can all just function well, I think that's part autonomously of and I think that I think that's part of the problem with um, maybe just treating this issue like a non-issue, right? Mm -hmm. And saying oh there was no real historical theological difference there was no difference in confession it was all political it was all this it was all that and when we sweep that under the rug and kind of make it a non-issue then there's mm -hmm. just kind of this oh we're just content and dialoguing and taking pictures together and you know um, maybe praying together at services or something like this or inviting a coptic bishop to stand in the front pew or something during our right, right. or maybe and these kinds of these kinds of things i kind of i lament over them because they on one hand, they look like they are like uh, bridging a gap, uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, it it's a little bit of a false unity because there's not this real dialogue that I think needs to really happen. You know, um, mm -hmm. we can't overcome um, you know real theological differences by just saying, "Oh, it was all in the." Uh, it was all in the past or mm -hmm. water under the bridge or there was there was all political there was no like big brethren <laughs> right we have to right. we have to grapple with um with you know saints that that in our hymnography you know um are are triumphant over certain heresies and and will maybe even specify um, people who are venerated, right, in in mm -hmm. the Coptic Church, and so uh, we have to start having these dialogues of, well, how do we overcome this issue? How do we um, talk about um, these figures in the early church, and how do we talk about um, the 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 fourth ecumenical council and also the fifth ecumenical council that was very big in our in in a division as well. Um, mm -hmm. you know, those things really have to be hashed out. You know, we can't just start having liturgy together and start communing with one another because it would be, I think that it would be, um, a, a big mistake for both parties. You know, um, we owe mm -hmm. it to each other, I think, and to our saints of the past who have suffered over these issues, um, to really have a, a an honest dialogue about it an honest um, talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I'm not a big fan of all the, uh, <laughs> it seems very political, you know, the let's yeah. take a picture together. Let's do these, you know, prayer days together and sure. whatever. And it's like, this, that's nice, but you know, let's, let's be real about it. Um, is there someone that a scholar, a theologian, a layman, a priest the clergyman anyone in the coptic church that maybe you look to now because i don't know what it is from from the other side's perspective mm -hmm. maybe they may give some credibility towards or, or credence to yeah um, or does it have to happen like i mean obviously it has to happen with like specific offices right like some layman has no authority to <laughs> To, to, to bridge the to bridge the gap like so obviously it has to happen like on a, a synod level and with the bishops and things like that but um is there anyone just i mean i'll start i'll start with just i i always thought and and i'm gonna confess right now um when i was younger i was very like had that like coptic uh pride you know and i was yeah. looked to the eo and i was like man yeah, they're so they're so smart and they read a lot of books and and yada yada, but the spirit's not there. You mm -hmm. know, we have we have we have that early church spirit and and the, the monastic, you know, um, 
life is present and even like in the world um, to mm-hmm. a certain degree with the fasting and all of that. I was completely wrong, by the way. <laughs> um, the more I get, the more I get to know um, the leaders and the people in the EO, like yourself and 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 Father Josiah Trenum and and all these great people. I'm like, uh, these are really devout spiritual people, and when I saw the the movie Man of God about Abba Nectarius, that's like, I don't know if this is legal or not. And I, I just say that jokingly, but that's like my patron saint now. I, I, I love that guy. Um, and what I love most about the, the whole movie was, was two parts where one, where he asks, uh, I guess the principal or whatever, you know, do you have peace? You know, are you at peace? Mm-hmm. And you could see that Abba Nectarius just, he had that peace, you know? Yeah. And then the other part was where they're kind of raiding the the monastery, mm-hmm. um, and they're persecuting him, and he and and all the the nuns are uh, at the convent are just kind of looking towards him to do something, and he just kind of does one of these shh and points yeah. up yeah. Um, that that God's got this kind of so. I learned so much, I learned so much, and and I continue to learn so much from you and your lectures and not just theological things and, and historical and all philosophical, but spiritual. You know, um, an interesting string in St. Nectaris' life is that um, in his theological school, um, mm-hmm. one of the, he educated, uh, when he was a teacher at the school, he educated one of the Coptic popes around. No way. Yeah. That that went to that went to theological school in Greece under Nectarius, then went back and was and was elevated. Um, I forget his I forget his name, but mm-hmm. it would be you know one of his contemporaries, or at least maybe was a child during the time of Saint Nectarius, then maybe after his repose became, but I'm not sure exactly. Because he was he was originally based in Egypt, right? Yeah, he was originally. Um, in Egypt, um, Pentapolis is the place that he was made a bishop of, and then um, he then obviously because of the the rumors of scandal and things like that was exiled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know that EO really like uh, Father Matthew the Poor. Yeah, Have yeah. You read his works. And it's a famous. Know. It's a famous one, and you know who else is famous too? Um, well, not super famous. Probably, probably more. Um, Eastern Orthodox have have you know come across quotes by Matthew the Poor and stuff like that than this figure, but um, but many people, including some priests, have you know read the life of um, Pope Carilos, right, and been really um, oh yeah inspired mm-hmm. by by his, especially how how he came to be. Pope, right, and his humble beginnings and his monastic beginnings and um, mm-hmm. things like that are very inspiring as well. Yeah, I don't really know that. Uh, you don't have to give me the whole structure now, but for the Coptic people listening, the structure of the the hierarchical structure of the EO Church is it seems a lot more decentralized than the like. Obviously, within the Oriental family, there's 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 the seven different families, but the Coptic Church, the structure is pretty clear. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, for example, you know, you're Antiochian. I think your bishop is in New York, right? Am yeah. I right there? Yeah. Um, so it's is it like less geographically based? Um, can you can you, in a in a simple way, explain the structure? Yeah, I mm. mean, it, it's a little, I, I think it's a little bit similar to the mm. Orientals because you have these different different families, right? The Ethiopians and um, and the, some of the Armenian. Armenians. Mm. And then there's a Melankara church, the Melankara church, right? But I know there's like a different Melankara church that maybe is not in communion with the Syri- Syriacs or something like mm, that. Correct, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so you have all of them, right? And they and and all of them have come to America for the most part, and have set up for the most part um, different jurisdictions here in America. Um, it's the same. It's very similar with with um, with us. Is that we had all of the Russians, Greeks, um, Syrians, 
right, come from different parts of the world and come establish the Greek Orthodox Church in America or the Antiochian Archdiocese here in America, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia when um, it was under communism um, and the, you know, the, the, the homeland was under communism and things like that. And so um, the way that things were set up here was very, you know, decentralized. You know, we hope that one day there will be in God's time and when, um, when we kind of maybe grow up a little bit, uh, that there'll be a, 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 a Orthodox uh, primate of America, of all of America, right? Where mm-hmm. all of the Orthodox churches uh, fall under his jurisdiction, you know? Um, but for right now, we've got, you know, uh, we've got the Serbs, we've got the Greeks, we've got um, the Russians, we've got the Syrians, and they're all, you know, mm-hmm. so have three bishops in the same city, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that is totally contrary to canon law and right. <laughs> totally uh, irregular, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, this has become kind of a pattern in all parts of the world where um, refugees have, have gone um, and established uh, various churches throughout Europe. Right. In the, in the in the new world in south america and north america um same thing in in other parts of of different other other parts of the world but because it's all it's it's almost like you're making culture first as opposed to faith right yeah it's, and you know yeah. saint Tikon, um one of our saints who came here in america um you know he the way that the 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 church the orthodox church was ruled here in america in the very beginning was um, was a much more regular, and that is, they were all under, uh, for the most part, all under the the Russian primate, which was Saint Tikhon um, for mm-hmm. a period of time. And um, under him, he had Saint Raphael of Brooklyn, who catered to the Syrians who came over here, right? Um, and so there were different arms, if you will, within one jurisdiction that catered to the language or the ethnicity, if you will, of, um, of the various Orthodox all through America, right? And that was a great structure because you had one primate, right? One uh, metropolitan of America or Bishop of America. Mm-hmm. And under him, he would oversee uh, various uh, bishops who maybe spoke uh, Greek or spoke Russian or spoke um, mm-hmm. Arabic and would be able to minister to the different pockets of mm-hmm. of these ethnicities. It's kind of like how big cities have a Chinatown and a Korea <laughs> town, and, right? right, right. A yeah, little Saigon right. or something like that, right? And so the church was kind of, it, it, it was carrying out its missionary work um, to mm-hmm. the American people, but at the same time had um, a pastoral eye out for those who needed it, right? Uh, culturally mm-hmm. coming over here and being overwhelmed with this new place and needing to hang on to their orthodoxy. And um, but after after Saint Tikhon went back to Moscow and everything happened with World War One and the uh, onset of communism in in Russia and the breakdown of the church under persecution, that uh, structure kind of fell apart. Um, so we all went back, if you will, to kind of our uh, motherland, the motherland mentality. Yeah. Um, and there has been times, you know, over the past hundred years of uh, since that time of Saint Tikhon to kind of uh merge all of the churches um together and there's other times we're like we're gonna go into our own corners maybe maybe this will work maybe it won't work and so i mean Mm -hmm. in time in time uh god will allow us to uh to come together you know Um, well maybe not i don't want to be a debbie downer but is this like maybe a fulfillment of revelations where you know the church is just divided and and perhaps, perhaps I mean, I... <laughs> perhaps you know perhaps okay. <laughs> i mean i think that there's there's some good that has come out of i, I don't want to say has come out of the the division because division is never good but there has been mm-hmm. 
some good things that have been preserved, if you will, I think, mm -hmm. because of a an attachment to the motherland, right, or the mm -hmm. homeland. Um, I think that there are certain things that have, that have been preserved in the churches because of that mentality. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are other things that are destructive, you know, with that mentality. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's a little bit of a you know, you have some wins on give and take, on, yeah. On, some wins on the other. Mm -hmm. What's what's life like in uh in Lompoc where you live? <laughs> it's great. It's a small town, mm -hmm. <laughs> forty five thousand people. Um, and you know people around town. No, you traffic. know the mayor. Know the mayor. <laughs> no traffic. No billboards. Uh -huh. Um, clear skies, for the most part. Not all the time and great weather and uh you don't want to go back to the oc there oh they no transfer you to a parish oh, there no. yeah. I, <laughs> leave me alone in my village i say <laughs> we, sometimes we have we go down to visit family or after go down for clergy things to orange mm -hmm. county or to la and um you know getting into la it's like man <laughs> So not missing this. I'm not, <laughs> not missing the billboards, the advertisements, the big trucks, the, especially the traffic mm -hmm. and uh, all kinds of things. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's this. In your life now, you're you're kind of more tied to the land in a way. You sounds yeah. like you got some animals and stuff going on there. Yeah, you thought I heard some ducks or yeah, you probably some, heard, something was making noise. Throughout the there. interview, you've probably heard ducks quacking and dogs barking. <laughs> Yeah, we raise yeah. ducks and we sell duck eggs to restaurants here. Um, cool. It's one of the things that we do and uh, gives our, our kids a good uh, like good experience in childhood and taking care of animals and taking care of the land and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. we found living here is, is a lot more conducive to a, a slower uh, pace of life and a much quieter type of life and with less distraction and the great thing about it i mean i've said all these other things about weather and geography and population and streets and things like that but um all of the people live at least they live at, at most who live in town 15 minutes away from the parish mm. and um if somebody's traveling far, they maybe live a half an hour or 40 minutes away from the parish. And so we have services every day. We have liturgy very often and people are able to come, you know, they're not bound by traffic um, and things like that. There's not really too many impediments um, that keep them from being able to live out the liturgical life and praying in the church every Sunday and things like that. And so, that's the most beautiful part of it all mm -hmm. is that we're able to have that kind of quiet, um, slower paced life with as many services as, uh, as we want, uh, together, yeah. close knit community together. It seems, it seems to me like that's how we were meant to live that slower, Definitely. quieter life tied to the land where you have a stake in it. <laughs> you're living off of it um but i don't i don't know if you've heard about these kind of movements and pushes to re really restrict like local farming and, and selling of of goods you you can make it you make it on your own land i know this is happening a lot in canada mm. um is that and not to be conspiratorial again but is that just another you know another it, not it's like a, it's always done under the pretext of safety right sure yeah so, yeah we, know, we can't we, there's you know these are unregulated you know right. blah 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 but is it is it really like this lifestyle is just makes people more peaceful it is. <laughs> and it they is. might find god if they're peaceful so. yeah it's more natural <laughs> you know um, um what's great about this town too is that since it's small and for the most part uh, mostly blue collar workers, you know, mm -hmm. here, um, it's a little bit more down to earth and, uh, mm -hmm. things like the COVID craziness that maybe you experienced in LA was like 
nothing up here. Mm, no. um, and we're probably like five years behind everybody else and a lot of things uh, from internet to paying bills online to um, <laughs> then all the way to the other stuff, the LGBTQ culture and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so far um, removed, I guess, from what is happening in big cities, you know. Um, yeah. I'm always shocked and I tell my people, you know, who spend most of their life here and almost never leave, you know, that they don't really know how good they have it because when I go to visit Los Angeles or whatever, you know, it's, it, it's really shocking to see mm -hmm. where culture has gone and how far removed yeah. from, you know, morale, Christian morality, um, we've gotten, um, it's something that we don't really think much here because we don't see it uh, mm -hmm. at least yet we don't see it and, and people aren't happy they're not happy in these big cities they're just yeah. like you just look at people's faces this just <laughs> right, right, right. just look sad <laughs> all right, the time right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's oppressive um, it's oppressive yeah and here we have the, the clean fresh air and slower pace of life yeah. and i hear that talked about a lot now actually um, by more like conservative people about architecture itself. Architecture mm -hmm. itself can be designed in a way that uh, causes you to admire beauty Absolutely. and God and, and nature, or it can be oppressive. It can just, you know, you're living in this concrete jungle, you know, surrounded by towers that all look the same and yeah. they're gray and dark and yeah, I don't um, think we have a, a, a building in our town that is higher than three stories. Wow. So when we go to like Los Angeles with our kids, they see like a seven-story building. They're like, <laughs> that is a huge skyscraper. <laughs> skyscraper. <laughs> Tower of Babel. <laughs> uh. yeah. yeah, it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. Yeah, that's so funny. Um, so d definitely don't miss the big city. Um, I saw on your Pinterest that you were looking at. Uh, this is from a while a while ago. Um, I just do a deep dive on people when I when I interview them. But you had you 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 had some saved things about kind of the architecture of a church with the nave and and, and all of that stuff. Um, do you do you guys have a like a new constructed building? Was it? Is it, is it structured that way? And um, we, do you guys have plans for the future? What, what's the what's yeah. the status of St. Timothy right now? If it's you can probably, also give us maybe a little history on it in your service saving, there. Th those like saved stuff is probably from when we were doing a lot of remodeling. Mm -hmm. When I came here, we basically gutted the entire church worship area and rebuilt it all um we retile we from paint on the walls to the tile on the floor um a lot of the iconography too um has been an ongoing um improvement and things that we've done and so um i like to look at a lot of references from churches or classical architecture or um i visit sometimes the um Spanish mission over here. And I kind of like to look at the kind of what Christianity first looked like when it came here, mm -hmm. you know, um, through the Spaniards and um, borrow some of that, uh, those ideas once in a while when we're working on things of the church. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're in a pretty small space and um, on a really good Sunday um, there's, almost nowhere to to be inside of the church you know so mm -hmm. at, at some point we are yeah looking for a different place yeah and yeah. you're you're kind of contributing to that that blessing you've got five kids yourself right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly that, that's exactly. awesome yeah um, so so um hopefully one day you know god willing we'll we'll have uh, we'll have a, another place to be. Mm -hmm. you know, we just, we've outgrown our building. We don't really have room for the kids uh, for like a Sunday school and stuff like that for the kids and um, other things. So 
I'm definitely had my eye on a few different places in town and uh, hopefully one day mm -hmm. we'll be able to land one of those. God willing. You mentioned taking some of the Spanish style from the missions that were there. Um, and I've heard you mention this before about St. Paul saying um, that uh, he became all things for all people. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that what that means? Because some people can take that in like a raw, like too far. Sure. How do, you, <laughs> how do you become all things for all people so that you can bring them to Christ? Yeah, I mean, I think St. Paul's um, St. Paul's life is a great example of that because when he came um, amidst the Greeks, you know, when he was in Athens, he went to, he, he didn't just go in there, you know, Bible thumping and preaching hellfire, you know, to, to convert people. He went around and he inspected the culture and he went to all the different authors or sorry, altars um, mm -hmm. in Athens and he found one to the unknown God, right? And that's what he used to preach from. He didn't uh, outright start saying all these other gods are false. We need to throw them down, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like that came later um, when the gospel was able to be heard. But in order for people to hear the gospel, he used part of their culture. So he said, you know, let's talk about the uns let's talk about this unknown God. I want to tell you about this unknown God, because I know who he is, right? Mm -hmm. And he used that to explain who Christ is. And that was the way in which he um, brought the gospel to those people. So he used part of their culture part of something that they were familiar with um, and a mystery, I guess, in their culture in order to convey the truth to them so their ears wouldn't be shut up right away, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's like, a, it, it, it's a great, you know, if we're, if the apostles are fishermen, right, they knew how to mm -hmm. uh, lure their, their prey, if you will, um, uh, how to cast their net, how to bait their hook. Um, mm -hmm to be able to catch the nations. And um, we have to do the same thing. Of course, like you said, we can't go, can't go over the top, right? We can't say, well, I'm gonna go to um, this, these concerts or uh, clubs or whatever, and I'm gonna convert people by being like them, right? <laughs> it's, not about, it's not about assimilating uh -huh. um, the culture and becoming like the culture in order to convey the gospel, right? It's about um, being wise and using something in, in a person's life or in a person's culture and using that in order to bait and to hook uh, somebody into receiving the gospel and opening their heart, right? Um, and that's what Death of the World what was doing is that it was this uh, bait and hook. Um, it was setting a trap, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I know some people might maybe not like that terminology because it's not good to set traps for people, but when it's to bring, what, what, but when it's to resurrect people and bring them hope and they would otherwise not uh, listen or shut up their ears mm -hmm. real quick, you know, then, then it becomes something that is, um, that is out of love and for one, what we see as for one's own benefit, you know? Mm -hmm. So Awesome, Father, and uh, I know you've helped uh, a lot of people um, having the spirit of St. Paul come to come to Christ. For those who uh, maybe are just finding out about you through this and, and want to, you know, keep in contact with you and, and, and your lectures and your work and death to the world, where, where can they find you and um, how, do, how do they do that? Yeah, so they can find death to the world just by going to deathtotheworld.com. Um, mm -hmm. uh, with no spaces or hyphens or anything. And um, you can follow us on Instagram, um, on Facebook, though I don't really, we don't really interact through Facebook too much. Uh, a lot of our posts on Facebook just come from our Instagram itself. Um, and there's also a podcast called Ekne Kron that you can get 
through Apple or through Spotify, and that's linked on the website as well um, to hear different talks and lectures and stuff like that um, through there. So, okay. Uh, do you want to take us out on a short prayer? Abba? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, it is truly me to bless thee, the Theotokos, ever blessed and all blameless, and the Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the Word, and are truly Theotokos, thee to be magnified. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Of course, it was wonderful to meet you and uh, and to have this conversation. That was my pleasure.